Hi there, and welcome to a little uh, bit of a tutorial on uh, cardioversion uh, versus pacing, uh, which I hope will be helpful. Uh, at our college, at uh, SAIT, uh, these two procedures are taught in the same semester, and uh, some of the similarities between them sometimes get people confused, so hopefully this will be a little bit of a help. <clears throat> so, as you can see, our patient here is in tachycardia of the ventricles, what we would sometimes call ventricular tachycardia. If he was stable, if he was sort of fine with this rhythm, uh, we would probably give him drugs. Uh, but let's pretend today that our patient is in fact unstable. So he has some shortness of breath or some hypotension, some severe chest pain, uh, or altered LOC, some combination, or, uh, <clears throat> or even one in a, uh, in a, in a bad enough way. So uh, to cardiovert this gentleman, what we're actually doing is sending energy in, um, or trying to send energy in right in a particular point on the QRS. And uh, what we're actually more trying to do is avoid the T wave. So let's look over here. And you can see that we have uh, the on button, energy select, uh, charge, and the big lightning button, which is uh, where we fire the charge uh, into the paddles. And right beside there, we have a, a switch called sync. So to perform a synchronized cardioversion, we're going to use this switch. So I'm going to press sync. And you'll see that the sync light is flashing. And if we look over to the uh, monitor again, we'll see that now that there are what we sometimes call um, champagne glasses or arrows, and the monitor is using software algorithms inside it to do what we call flagging. So what it's doing at this point is telling you, this is what I think is the R wave. This is where I'm gonna fire the energy. Now, if for some reason you think that uh, the monitor has chosen wrong, um, what you can do is change the lead. Oops. And uh, that will potentially um, <clears throat> get you a better uh, you know, position on the QRS. Hopefully this doesn't happen too often. Anyway, so now we're ready to uh, do a synchronized cardio version. So move back over here um, and I will press energy select and machine, this machine defaults to 200. We'd usually start a little lower than that. So I'm gonna start at 100 joules. <clears throat> I'm gonna press charge. So at this point, um, you of course I'm clear, you're clear, everyone is clear and shock. So, and our patient uh, did not convert, he's still in VTAC, and so what we'd have to do if he was, uh, you know, still had a pulse and was still sort of in the same situation is uh, increase our energy level. <clears throat> so gone up to, let's go up to 150 for no particular reason. Um, <clears throat> what you'll notice is as soon as I uh, fired that charge, the sync switch turned off. So each synchronized cardio version you do, you have to repress uh, the sync switch. So I'll do that again. So we can see sync is flashing again. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, uh, the machine has chosen, again, uh, a different part of the QRS than it was on before. And you'll see this sometimes. So the main thing is that you're fairly certain that it uh, has chosen the R wave and you're absolutely certain it hasn't chosen the T wave. Um, because a, a, a shock on the T wave is most likely to send the patient into uh, V-fib. All right, so I am going to uh, hit charge. And by the way, it doesn't have to be done in this order. So if for some reason, um, I just turned the sync switch off. If for some reason you forgot to hit sync up until this point, you can still turn the sync switch off or on very easily. All right, so firing. All right, so that's cardioversion. All right, so here's our patient again, or hopefully perhaps a, a different patient. And uh, the uh, patient we had before was in VTAC, he was in a tachycardia and unstable, and we needed to uh, cardiovert him. This patient more or less has the opposite problem. He's uh, got a very low heart rate, and uh, some patients may tolerate this okay, 
But if, um, again, if they're experiencing symptoms related to the bradycardia, we have to try and fix that. Uh, now, depending on the type of rhythm and how bad the symptoms are, we may choose to use uh, drugs such as atropine to try and incre increase the rate. Um, however, the patient is uh, uh, not responding to the drugs or very, very unstable, um, pacing may be a, a better uh, choice. Uh, so we can look over here on the side of the monitor. This is a light pack 15. The light pack 12 is fairly similar. And you can see that uh, all of the controls you need to pace the patient are in this little green box. So let's turn on the pacer. And what you see is that this machine has been set uh, to uh, sort of start out at 60 beats per minute. And the other thing you'll notice is that again, we're seeing arrows on the intrinsic QRSs of our patient. Uh, so in cardio version, again, those arrows are there because the machine is more or less saying to you, I'm gonna fire right where this arrow is. Here in pacing, what the machine is basically saying is I am seeing these beats as the patient's own intrinsic rhythm and I am not going to pace over them. So um, our pacer uh, rate was set at 60. Um, the patient's heart rate is 40. Because the pacer's in demand mode, what it's going to try to do is achieve a total heart rate of 60 beats per minute. And it's gonna do that by inserting uh, um, pace, uh, pace beats in between the patient's own intrinsic rhythm. So. Uh, you can see that you can alter the rate here if you wish to. Um, you can make it 70, we can make it 80, you can take it quite high. Um, typically, with most patients, there's probably no reason to go much, be, much above 80, um, certainly not to start with. Um, I would start at 60 or 70. Um, yeah, so we've set our rate. Let's, let's make it sort of a, uh, almost a typical 70 beats per minute. Um, so now we start to increase current. So I'm at zero, zero milliamps now, and I'm at 10, and now I'm at 20. Um, so what you're seeing here now is a, there's another change, and you're seeing spikes appear between the patient's own um, QRSs. So what those are, that's the machine delivering energy, and we typically call that a pacer spike. Um, so the machine is delivering energy to the patient, um, but at this point, uh, it's not enough energy to cause a response in the heart. Um, so we'll increase the current a little bit. So this, uh, this procedure is, is generally uh, fairly painful, uh, I would say. Um, at 50 milliamps, you're going to see definitely some uh, discomfort in most patients. Um, and it's uh, unlike a cardioversion where the shock is there and gone. This is persistently painful, of course. Uh, so let's increase it a bit more here. <clears throat> so now we see another change. Now what we see is that uh, behind each pacer spike is a wide bizarre QRS complex. So this is what we call electrical capture. So basically what's happened is uh, enough energy is being delivered to the heart to cause a ventricular response. We have electrical capture. What we don't know at this point is if that electrical response actually translate, translates into um, a, a good uh, systole of the heart. So what we have to do at this point is check the pulse of our patient. If the pulse is 40, we don't have mechanical capture. If the pulse is, uh, is 70 or 80, that's wonderful. We have uh, electrical capture and mechanical capture. Um, but if we still have a bradycardic pulse, basically all this is just window dressing over the fact that the, the patient still has a bradycardia. Um, so if we have a pulse, uh, we would now increase the current, uh, generally 10 more, um, to make sure that that capture is sort of steady. And that is more or less the difference between uh, pacing and cardioversion.